So hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Bernie Siegel. I'm the executive director of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation and founder and chair of the annual World Stem Cell Summit. We've done 18 of those over the years. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be able to have another uh, interview as part of the, our foundation's Portraits of Hope series. And this is uh, of Kristen McDonald, someone that I just recently met through a webinar related to uh, Prop 14, the California Stem Cell Research Treatments and Cures Initiative. So Kristen, welcome to this. Uh, and also it's a day of celebration, isn't it? Uh, it? Historic election and so happy that you just gave me the final news that the count is official that we made it with Prop 14. Well, it looks like it passed with about 1% and nobody said this was gonna be easy, exactly. right? Because these are challenging times, a time of existential crisis with COVID yes. and a lot of economic worries. So the fact that the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine can continue its great work with $5.5 billion and general uh, uh, public bond initiative to be able to fund this uh, uh, research and bring regenerative medicine as a platform medicine is a really big deal. It's really unbelievable, you know, especially as you said, in the time of COVID, money was scarce. Uh, there was a slim budget for the, for the you know, uh, for Prop 14. And that's why the grassroots e roots efforts were so important and patient advocacy. And of course, being headed up by the wonderful team with Bob Klein, Melissa, Mitra, Jacqueline, it goes on and on. Well, uh, in no small part, Kristen, because of inspiring stories that of patient advocates such as yourself. So I, I wonder if you'll take a moment and share with our audience your personal journey as a person that had a very serious and difficult diagnosis at age 30. I'd be happy to, Bernie. Uh, you know, there's that old saying, you know, you, you make a plan, the best made plans sometimes don't work out, you know, man plans and God laughs. And I was 21 when I started to get some changes in my retina, but it was just a, a visit to the eye doctor with some floaters and he kind of passed it off. And a few years later, uh, when I was 24 or so, I went to a retinal specialist and he, you know how retinitis pigmentosa, the condition that I ended up having, is very difficult to diagnose if you talk to an ophthalmologist. And he couldn't figure it out either. He just thought something was going on. But at that time, shortly thereafter, my sister, my beautiful sister, got hit by a drunk driver and it sent the whole family upside down. It was a very, very bad accident. And um, and so we kind of ignored it. And so at that point, my mid twenties, I, I was living life in Manhattan, working for Eyewitness News, my first job out of college. My dream was to be an actress and a talk show host. And I, I, I started, you know, my night vision started failing me. So I started tripping and falling, but I, I went into deep denial because the rest of my vision was perfect. I could drive, I could work, I could do everything. And I wanted to move to the West Coast. But the time I had hit age 30, I had a small role on an NBC soap opera and life was good. I had an agent, little red sports car, and I, I got my second broken arm at an NBC cast party. And, um, and shortly thereafter, I found out, you know, when I was in a real cast, that I was going to either have a brain tumor or be diagnosed with a condition that would cause me to go blind. So it was rather devastating at that age. You know, your whole dreams just poof, go right in front of you. Well, indeed, and uh, as I was sharing with you earlier, uh, at age 48, um, in the prime of my legal career in Miami, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. And I had a very rough year of my life, which I bounced back, and as they say, knock on wood, uh, many years later, I'm fine. But anyone who's uh, in their prime or even starting their uh, career and their ascent to be set back like that, it's devastating. and. Uh, some people, it's, uh, it, they carry that weight and can't get beyond it. Others somehow muster uh, the strength or the circumstances to be able to move beyond it. So you and I both can look at our lives, I'm sure, and be thankful that we have uh, progressed as best we can after a, a, a shock like that. And certainly you have uh, in, in your journey. And along the way, uh, you 
if I understand correctly, sought treatments for your eye condition, went to many medical professionals. Tell us about that journey that uh, ended up in you uh, being treated at UC Irvine. I did, thank you. But first I, I want to applaud you because uh, I've had other friends with colon cancer and just cancer in general. And I, I can't even imagine what you went through at that age and to do everything that you're doing and have done you know, for stem cell therapy and medicine is just incredible. So I kudos to you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, many people give up going to the eye doctor uh, because going blind is so painful. And every year when you go to the eye doctor, especially with something like RP, 30 years ago at Jules Stein, the doctor said to me that, that hang in there, they're working on it. They're, we're gonna have gene therapy very soon. I was 30 years old at the time. I hung on his words. And that was coupled with the fact that the first doctor had a very, very bad bedside manner. And I, I, I went into a tailspin really of depression for a, a month or two until I saw this other doctor and he gave me hope. He just changed the whole picture. So with that, I went on and with a great counselor and family support and friends. Uh, and I sought many, you know, different, I, I started raising money in the field when I sort of got out of denial, went into acceptance, which is part of my second vision system. And I, I just decided that I was going to do all the research I could on anything that was going to be happening for eye conditions. And it still took so many years. And uh, I remember 10 years ago, I went to a study uh, in Beverly Hills at Retina Vitreous, and I blessed them for getting me into it, but it was genetically modified cells. And I had to have two surgeries and it was very discouraging, almost 40 hours at the eye doctor one week. And my eyes didn't change. In fact, I got a little worse for a while and then I got better, but not from the, the, um, the, um, the study. So PS 10 years later, because the Bush administration had held up the stem cell progress that we were hoping for, I got a phone call saying that I'd be the first uh, in Dr. Henry Clausen's study for RP. And that was just, uh, I was over the moon. I can't even tell you the excitement. I felt like I had won the stem cell lottery. <laughs> so uh, what, did you, what kind of treatment did you undergo? And this was part of a clinical trial? Yes. And the first trial for anyone, I was the first patient, by the way, in many parts of the world to have it done. So it was very exciting. Uh, you have to kind of sign a lot of papers. You know, we didn't know what it would do. Hopefully there was, you know, there was no rejection, thankfully. It was very safe. It's, a, it's an injection in you know, in the office, which is much better compared to some surgeries, which take five hours for a chip to be put in your eye or something. Uh, but um, the first study really is for safety and nobody thought I would get an improvement, but lo and behold, two and a half months later, I started getting increased light perception. And, you know, I want to explain to the audience with retinitis pigmentosa, I'm not a hundred percent blind now, but I am very legally blind. I can see the edge of my computer screen, I see light and dark, I see pieces of things, I see my hand waving, but I can't see my ring. I know what I'm wearing from memory, but I, I can't see the print on my dress. So, uh, so getting this injection, and, and retinitis pigmentosa gets worse every single year. That's one of the, the terrible, devastating things about it. It's constant loss. But with this injection, I've not had loss it's increased the eye lens in my peripheral in both eyes because I two years later had another injection with double the dose in my right eye. Uh, but these were still lower doses because they had to test people after me to see if the higher doses were successful. And now the study results are out and those study results have proven that many people are getting better results with the high, high doses. But I've still had stability and more light. My light at the end of the tunnel. It's 11.30. Excuse me. I have assistance all over the place. <laughs> So, so uh, as you said, this is now light at the end of the tunnel. Right. So did you understand that you were, uh, your eyes were being injected with living cells? Yes. And were these embryonic stem cells or do you yes. know what kind of cells they, they were? were? Progenitor cells, embryonic, but progenitor cells. So what's the next step in your treatment? And, and let me just tell the audience who may not know about progenitor cells, progenitor cells uh, are created so they have a purpose, so they know where they're going and they don't create a tumor or something. 
So uh, what's the next step for you in, the, in your uh, treatment? The next step is that, uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, um, actually, we were waiting since last November uh, because we were hoping that I'd get my next injection. And then it got delayed with funding. Then the funding came in, and then COVID hit. So uh, going blind is a lesson in patience, I tell people. <laughs> I am hoping it could still be this fall. And uh, if not, it will probably be as soon as the numbers even out or they find a safe way to do it, you know, but uh, I thought it was going to be in 2020, no pun intended, this was going to be my big year and 2020 surprised all of us with many different things. So the events weren't on our bingo card, as they say. Exactly. Well, you know, um, Kristen, I know of you, of course, as a stem cell advocate. And I serve on a couple of boards. I was on the board with Bob Klein on the campaign itself for Prop 14. And, but I'm also on the board of Americans for Cures, which was aligned with my organization all the way back in 2004 for Prop 71. We were cheerleaders as advocates. Uh, we had our first uh, advocacy patient meeting, and I would say in the history of stem cell advocacy back in 2004, uh, and Bob Klein was there and, uh, at Berkeley. Uh, back in the day, which was a conference that my group and other grassroots organizations uh, created. So uh, advocacy is a journal, a journey, excuse me, advocacy is a journey. And your own journey is fascinating, fascinating to me. And I too am on the a board on uh, Americans for Cures. So, which is a phenomenal organization. Phenomenal. Uh, uh, it's uh, the executive director, I believe is Melissa King, someone we, yes. we like very much, of course and as a friend and an ad fellow advocate. So how did you become affiliated with Americans for Cures? Actually, I owe that to Dr. Clausen. Uh, shortly after we had some results with my stem cell, they asked me if I would do a video. And uh, I did that so they could sort of take it around to the board of CIRM and show results. And I, I think they took it to various different places. And uh, Paul Bresky, my, my dear friend, the CEO of uh, JSite, shot that video with another uh, one of Dr. Clausen's associates. And they discovered, I guess, that I was, you know, formerly a, you know, I'm a radio host and that sort of thing that I, I like to get out there and be a spokesperson. So Dr. Clausen uh, referred me to Americans for Cures who asked me to be an ambassador and I was honored. And of course, Americans for Cures and their patient ambassadors uh, were the uh, grassroots troops that helped lead the charge for now Prop 14, which as we uh, mentioned earlier in, in this interview has uh, been reported as having passed today um, in, in the election in November. So we are very, very happy about that. And I've uh, had an opportunity to see your own interviews at a CIRM meeting and also participate in the webinar that we had last week with the closing arguments for Prop 14, and we can look back now and say we were successful, which is uh, fantastic, a fantastic feeling. I wanna find out a little bit more of what the future holds for you. I've heard a lot about your radio show, Second Vision, and would you describe that uh, to us and let us know how we might be able to tune in? I understand it's very inspirational. Oh, thank you. I, I actually will be getting back to my regular schedule this fall, but I took a little bit of a breather, uh, you know, because of the campaign, you know, to do webinars and that sort of thing. But it is, you can find it on uh, airslaw.org. And if you look up inspirational under second vision, all my podcasts are there. Some of them are archived, but they have, you know, the most recent ones, which the last one was Bob Klein for the campaign. So Airsla is A-I-R-S-L-A dot org. What does that, what does that mean? Airslaw.org, yes. That means um, American Internet Radio Service for the Blind and Vision Impaired. But like I said, anyone can listen, and I always post it, and the authors who come on are from all different genres, because my show isn't about eyesight. It's about, you know, creating a new vision for your life when the first one fails. So I've, I've interviewed scores of personal development people. Uh, you know, I, I've also done inspirational speaker speaking and workshops, and uh, I hope in the future, you know, when you ask me about my future plan, you know, one that the eyesight will get better, but I'm thinking of going on for life coaching. And I'd like to work also with doctors, you know, and the importance of how they diagnose a patient. 
you know, Jennifer Robb and I may team up in that way. She's talked to me about, you know, being a guest speaker at some of her events. And I think it's really important in continuing medical education courses that doctors learn, you know, they spend so many years in medical school, you know, learning about a disease, but only five minutes to deliver a diagnosis, which can change somebody's life in such a big way. Well, offline, we're gonna to have to share some of our uh, war stories and being patients and what we've seen. For myself, um, before my own diagnosis, I was a, truly a civilian, right, to, to a serious disease. Of course, we know of family and loved ones, but to experience it personally is, is very significant. And through advocacy, uh, Kristen, I've uh, had the chance to have the acquaintance and friendship of many people that are burdened with chronic disease. And you learn that a, a diabetic, uh, you know, the thought is they just take a shot of insulin and they're better. You don't realize they could have shock. You don't realize the day-to-day -day burdens until you understand the fear and the challenges. Same with Parkinson's, it's just not a medication so you won't have tremors, but the side effects and the devastation of these uh, afflictions. So um, as an advocate and through Americans for Cures, you know, we have to look what other people um, are dealing with. And sometimes we have to count our lucky stars, right? Absolutely. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and that's what uh, is so significant about, I think, um, the California Prop 14 campaign. Um, someone said, uh, genius minds and emphatic hearts, uh, when patient advocates uh, were gathering, talking about it. And I thought that was really resonated from our call the other night, because I feel that there were genius minds, people like Bob Klein and the scientists behind this, but it was the emphatic hearts that counted. Well, a collective, you know, the Mutual Admiration Club, as I always say, and, and, uh, and, and Bob Klein is just an unbelievable visionary, you know. Well, it is. It takes, it takes someone of single-minded uh, determination. Interesting. When you were talking about, you know, the role of the patient advocate, uh, early on in my career, I worked on seven different telethons. I hosted the cerebral palsy one in New York State. Uh, that was my goal, to get out there and come to Hollywood and host a talk show, be an actress. I worked as an associate producer, right from PA up to producing the, uh, the Easter Seal Telethon in Los Angeles. Just when I was young, that was one of my first telethons. And my point being, at that point in my career, I met so many different people, not only the, the celebrities that were hosting it, but I, that was a lot of fun, but I met these unbelievable champions, you know, suffering from, or challenged by uh, spinal cord injuries and uh, spina bifida and, uh, diabetes or a car accident, whatever the disability was, you know, I had no clue that I would be going blind. and I would be on the other side of the fence one day. So my point is, I'm so happy for the people who voted for the proposition because, you know, someone you love could be in need of stem cell one day. We're, we're all going to know somebody, whether it's yourself or somebody else. And so I'm so happy to be a pathfinder for doctors and, and patients. And it's given me a much greater purpose than to just have an injection in the eye doctors and walk away. Well, Kristen, you've been an inspiration to me for the short time that I've known you. And uh, I'm thrilled about your work. And let's, uh, let's follow that in the years to come. Thank you, Bernie.